Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. Well, here we should get morose and gloomy. This is the podcast. We're, of course, uh, recording this before Lent has started, but this is the podcast for the first Sunday in Lent 2024, February 18th. Mark 10, 17 through 20, uh, the, the rich man and uh, the call to sell all he has, the first shall be last, and so on. Now, most likely you already have your Lenten theme in place uh, and, you're, and you didn't listen to this before you months ago picked your Lenten theme. But if you have yet to pick a Lenten theme, we're going to be talking about these texts that are coming under the, uh, the time-worn a uh, trustworthy rubric of the upside down kingdom that the king who is going to be crowned on good friday is uh the king of an upside down kingdom whereas we're going to hear next week that the son of man came not to be served but to serve so with that introdu- introduction we get uh the story of the rich man and it starts with this a uh, good teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I like that there was a there was a grumpy old man in my hometown. With if he said, I think he did it on purpose. How are you? And someone would say, Good. He says, You're not good. No one's good but God alone. You're well. <laughs> uh, I think you know it's one of those uh, sort of like gotcha gr- kinds of yeah. Things. yeah. Uh, but um, then Jesus says, Well, you know what the commandments are. Do them. I've done all these since my youth. Okay, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. And uh, then he went away because he had many possessions. Now, the prosperity, I thought this was a text, the prosperity gospel, of course. How do you get around this? God does not want you to be prosperous. God wants you to give away all you, all you had. And then I listened to one, I don't know why, many years, listening to one of these uh, whack jobs. And he says, <laughs> don't you see, though? He's done all the commandments. And he has many possessions. See, uh, keep beating the law. God uh, will make you prosperous. I just thought, uh, my, wow, that's that's uh, creative, breathtaking, yeah, breathtaking, breathtaking, so. breathtaking hermeneutics. He does yeah. point out though a very fascinating thing. You know, this is a passage that troubles people a lot, and it especially troubles people in uh, the United States, uh, in mainline Protestant churches, where we are in the global situation, wealthier than wealthy can be. Yeah, and so the question being, where does this, uh, where does this leave us? I think that there are some things to ask ourselves about this text. This, this never occurred to me. I've read this text many times and thought about this particular problem. How do you do? You have to sell everything, and then I thought about Mark nineteen, uh, ten nineteen, and the, his response, of course, which is the teacher. I've kept all these things since my youth. And I realized, well, I haven't done that. So <laughs> maybe the possessions part is not the part that I need to worry about so much. And I think that there's this way in which Jesus is challenging this particular person, the opposite of what you are saying, of what that prosperity gospel t- teacher was saying, is that if you have followed these commandments, where did all of these possessions come from? Where did all of these possessions, as we'll see later, these discussions of the poor and supporting the poor? So I think there's a there's a tension there. Do you mean that he's lying about keeping all the commandments because how could he be rich? Uh, sorry, I'm just not following what you— Yeah, so in, in the sense that uh, the question being— with we see this so often throughout the so if we don't think of the ten of the commandments in terms of just the ten commandments, mm. but we think about these in terms of the calls we see throughout the Old Testament to take care of the orphan, to take care right. of the widow, to mm-hmm. take care of the alien amongst uh, I see you. What you're saying. Yeah, um, because as we've as we've seen throughout Mark, there is this suspicion of the logic of the empire, the logic of King Herod and his retinue and the way that they celebrate and uh, gather treasures for themselves. And so I think that there's a tension here that we have to uh, to see in this verse. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. So well, um, can I point out, yep, before uh, you jump in, Catherine, a reminder, we had the Ten Commandments in the fall. So we had Deuteronomy 5 back on October 8th, which is 
which includes the Ten Commandments. And then we had, I think the same Sunday, I think we had the Great Shema, the positive version of the first commandment. Mm -hmm. In two weeks, we're going to have the Great Commandment, which is then love the Lord your God, the positive version, and love your neighbor yourself. So when G, I don't know if there's anything to this. In a couple of weeks, Jesus is going to be asked, what's the greatest commandment? He doesn't ask that. He just asks this, which is, um, you know the commandments. And then Jesus himself summarizes the second table, not the first table. Um, and these are the things you are to do for your neighbor. Um, if I ever do get around to writing the book I thought might be my second book, uh, and, and it isn't, uh, it's the Ten Commandments are, are your neighbor's best life now. Mm -hmm. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You know, life, family, marriage, property. You shall not bear false witness. It's don't hurt your neighbor with your words. Um, don't defraud anyone, which is the version of coveting that they have. And then out of order, honor your father and mother. Take care of the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just the second table that Jesus quotes here. So if you think about it, it's he's focused on himself. What must I do? And these commandments all point him away from his own self-interest to paying attention to the neighbor. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that before. Uh, he's he he goes away grieving uh, because he has many possessions. Uh, his his heart is attached to his property, um, as is a, natural to human beings. Um, so then Jesus uh, looks around and uses this as a as a teaching moment for his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So there's lots of theories, right, about this, that there's a, a gate in that Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. That's silly. There's, there's nothing not. like that. This is This is hyperbole, uh, and it's meant to be taken as hyper hyperbole, right? Easier, f It's a real camel. It's a real needle. I have a needle. It's not uh, referring to some <clears throat> esoteric uh, kind of um, place uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus is saying that's it's, it's easier for this impossible thing to happen than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. But then the good news, and this is a word of law, and especially, as you said, Christopher, right, a word of law for uh, those of us in the West who may not think we're rich, but globally speaking are beyond uh, imagination rich. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, a word of law. So they say to one another, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. There's the gospel there <laughs> that there is. Uh, not that that lets us off the hook, right? Not that that lets us off the hook about taking care of our neighbors, as you were talking about, Rolf, and you, Christopher, right? Uh, the whole Old Testament tells us to care for our neighbors, especially for those most vulnerable among us, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the foreigner. Um, but it's not that that... Uh, that saves us. It's God. Uh, for God, all things are possible. No. This would be a chance. One of the things I learned years ago uh, when I was invited into conversations around stewardship is the church only talks about money when it talks about asking for it. Hmm. And so that's all people hear. Hmm. This might be an opportunity to talk about money without asking for it. Say, we're not asking for money. But Think about the power that your possessions have over you. I mean, mm. there's a great old statement I learned from my friend Mary Albing, which is possessions are their own punishment. Mm. It was one of her grandma's sayings, as I remember. And if you've ever gone through your grandma's house after after she's dead or your parents, you know, and I, I heard somebody has to go and empty a storage locker. So now we have all these, there's tons of mini storages around uh, the part of the cities where I lived. And it's like, so you got stuff, you're not willing to throw it away. So you just put it in a storage locker. You know, um, this is a serious problem we have with our yeah. possessions yeah. own us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things, so I think that's a wonderful way to uh, enter into one of these conversations about, again, what does this text mean for the people who are hearing it? Uh, because 
as we've talked about already, we are the rich young men in so many ways. I do think it's interesting, though, that as we get, and I'm glad that we have these three passages together, because Jesus is interested also in troubling our expectations around what it means to give everything up. So on the one hand, he troubles the expectation uh, that being wealthy is in itself a blessing. But then Peter, who is trying to pick up on this train of thought, says, look, we have left everything. Mm. We've followed you. Obviously, this must mean we get a reward. <laughs> and Jesus, it's a, it's a funny little thing. So the things that he talks about leaving— Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children's or fields. And then he says, you will get all of those back. But he adds an extra thing. What's the other thing that you will receive a hundredfold if you leave it? Persecution. Persecutions. And so the fact being that this is not in of itself a way to happiness or a way to solve your life's problems is just simply to get rid of all your possessions but that there is something greater going on here, and it, it's where he ends this, and in the age to come, eternal life. Hmm. That this is where he is trying to motivate the disciples and to, th- to think is not in terms of how these earthly blessings are playing out in their lives, but how the God is working there towards, as he says, the age to come.